Russ Baton with Roleplaying Bubble Radio. This is RBBR episode 136, playing for an audience. And with me uh, is for, for this episode is Caleb. How you doing, Caleb? Insert scathing comment about announcer <laughs> voice here. Why? Everyone loves you. Know, okay, I'll stop doing that. <laughs> uh, I've been, it's been a while. I've been in Peru, so I, I, I didn't have a chance to try out announcer voice for weeks at a time. So I was worried it was going to be rusty. Wait, so. you denied the Peruvian people announcer voice? I don't think they – well, they, they speak Spanish, and so they – Announcer I, voice – Breaks down all barriers. <laughs> well, okay. So the problem wasn't even that. It was that trying to explain what my podcast was about to people who've never heard of even Dungeons of Dragons. So uh, <laughs> that was an interesting cultural experience that I Yeah, cherish. but like you could have explained it in perfect English yeah. and they could have not spoken a word of that English <laughs> yeah. and they would have still known you were trying to sell them something <laughs> Yeah, and would have it's, awkwardly tried to leave. Yeah. <laughs> which is, you know, announcer voice communicates across, you know, all spectrums. I think dogs get it. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> anyway, this episode is going to be about uh, playing for an audience. In other words, recording your games uh, for possibly other podcasting or because there have been uh, several RPPR, spawn of RPPR, inspired by RPPR uh, podcasts or just recording your games uh, to share with friends, uh, family, I guess. I don't know. Or just <laughs> uh, or for Grandma. Archive, yeah. Yeah. Here's my Mama. paladin. Yeah. Mama, let me tell you about my character. <laughs> uh, That's that. when you're really trying to speed the elderly towards death. <laughs> wow. Telling them character. about your character. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about techniques and whys and how that changes your GMing style. So a little bit about RPPR, uh, as it were. Um, well, yeah, and also, yeah, well, we'll get into it. Yeah, yeah. A uh, few bits of news. Uh, first off, Puppet Land uh, from Arc Dream is now out. Uh, this is from John Scott Tynes, one of the Delta Green co authors. And uh, it's a new edition. It was kickstarted last year, the year before. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, And it's out at hardcover. It's beautiful. Uh, I got my contributors' copies, and that's why this is news, because I wrote uh, two adventures for it. Uh, so. Looks like Mirror Mask, the RPG. Oh, yeah. It's very pretty inside. Uh, and out. It's a very indie, uh, indie kind of storytelling game. Uh, there's a lot of interesting rules and mechanics in it. You know, like games are supposed to be one hour long specifically. Uh, everything you say is what your character says. Uh, so if you say, you can't just say, I open the door. It says, I will go open the door, you know. Uh, so... <laughs> Because uh, it's about puppets and like telling a story through puppets. Um, so we will, of course, do some actual plays of that now that we have the game. And uh, we'll post those at some point. We'll probably do two of them since each one's an hour long. Uh, we'll do maybe my two adventures. Ooh. Um, but that's up. Uh, other yeah, bit of news? nepotism, Peyton. <laughs> yeah. Is it really nepotism when it's like you're promoting the thing that you worked on creatively? Yeah, good point. Yeah, I mean... Jam yourself promotion. <laughs> okay, there you go. That's, that's more accurate. <laughs> uh, so, uh, next bit of news. Uh, Faust uh, from the Third Wheel and the... Uh, our own podcast now, uh, has moved. He has moved to Bellevue, Washington, because he's taken a job working on video games. His voice was too good for Missouri and has been taken to the West Coast so he can be a voice actor in an upcoming video game from uh, Camouflage. Uh, they did Republic, uh, which is a stealth sci-fi game for the PS4, I believe, and so there, he's working on some upcoming thing. Uh, he moved last week, and... Uh, so filed through his lock, <laughs> dug underneath the walls. Yeah, he escaped. His guards shall be severely disciplined. Yeah. Uh, so great we will, loss for the. We podcast. will still be doing stuff with Faust, um, as I mentioned on the After Hours podcast. We'll be doing online stuff uh, whenever he gets situated and our schedules all line up. Uh, we'll start up the Impossible Landscapes, uh, Carcosa Delta Green campaign. Uh, that may be a while, depending on his schedule and our own schedules. But he's not here physically anymore. Yeah. He's like Thad. Yeah. He's very pretty. <laughs> and he brought up the general yeah. physical appearance of the crew by many grades. Two points. Yeah. yeah. Easy. Yeah. Easy two points. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, well, it's the, we're, we're, we're an audio podcast, Caleb, so 
I know it's it's it makes the table a little darker, but it's it's fun. I mean, like before yeah. we were seen together, like yeah. someone could construe be, us as like he's still a group of high school friends, yeah. of which the majority had let themselves go horribly. Yeah, but now we're clearly a gaming group, <laughs> <laughs> like just being scammed. Like, yeah. oh no. Yeah, we're Dweebs. not the league anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, he will. He's still planning to go to Gen Con, and uh, so we will meet up with him there. I'm actually thinking of planning to go up to Seattle anyway next year. Uh, there's tons of gaming cons out there, and I could go visit him and record some podcasts with Glancy, uh, and uh, yeah, get to the West. Coast. I've never been to Seattle, so you know, it would be nice to see it. Uh, <laughs> I, having never been anywhere, yeah. sympathize. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and finally, a bit of news. I know everyone's talking about it. Uh, there was a presidential election. Uh, however, RPPR is not a political podcast. We don't talk about politics. So we're not going to talk about that. Uh, and that's about it. So let's get on to the topic. Uh Recording for an audience. Uh, this has actually been brought up a couple times by listeners about like um, – the div- like what is it like to record a game or run a game that you know you are recording i guess yeah and i it's been so long i've been doing it for so many years now that it doesn't really like occur to me it's just kind of my default mode but um i don't know i mean but now that i think about it, it is it is kind of an interesting uh conundrum um and this is this episode is not just for like other podcasters, but for anyone who thinks, and I think a lot. And of it's people, not entirely based on RPPR. Like, I mean, yeah. it's very odd to say, but like the actual play model, and not necessarily in podcasts, but in general, is kind mm. of like I don't want to say mainstream, but like it's exploded. It's kind of getting out there between Harmon Quest, Penny Arcade, uh, Critical all, Role, Critical Role of you know Faust's. Yeah, crew uh, in the uh, I forget the third wheel or third, thrilling intent. Yeah, thrilling intent, third wheel. I yeah, can't yeah. remember which one's the company name and which one's the <laughs> yeah. YouTube podcast. I think name. I think thrilling intent is the podcast name or the YouTube channel name. I'm getting old and doty in my yeah. Uh, but um, between all that stuff, like it, and then uh, you know Will Wheaton stuff, and like it's you know. There's multiple podcasts with celebrities playing D and D. Yeah, now. there's been some like finally they've gotten Vin Diesel on camera playing D and D. So yeah, and yeah, he's talked so, about it for years. So like it's finally. Uh, so between like YouTube podcasts, regular podcasts, uh, people are doing live actual plays now, mm-hmm. which just baffles me. Like sitting yeah. in like a on a stage doing it, and then. Uh, I think Critical Role had like 1,500 people in the theater at Gen Con yeah. watching them. And then you've got like the sort of production quality and quality of the players, like shots, like things like one shot. Like, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely becoming more mainstream. Yeah. To the point where I've at least had two people in my life that I said I played D&D for other people. And they, and they had a corollary to relate it to, <laughs> which... Is bizarre. <laughs> yeah, that's two hundred percent more in all previous years combined. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so it's becoming more mainstream, and it might be something like many of the people that have started podcasts um, from our PPR. Yeah, uh, you know, I think we're up like half a dozen now, or something. Yeah. Uh, that uh, yeah, that, uh, a short incomplete uh, shout outs to Drunk and Ugly. Uh, technical difficulties, uh, role playing exchange. Um, let's see here. I know I'm missing others. Uh, Ragnar Rock. Ragnar Rock. Yeah, yeah. Ragnar. yeah. Like there's a yeah, there's yeah. a lot of really great stuff out there. Um, and you might not want to be doing it too. And it's not necessarily a how to, yeah. but running a game when you're not just running it for the people at the table. Yeah, is. Uh, it requires some different writing skills, some different role playing skills, and some different considerations. Yeah, that you know might be useful to talk about it academically, because you know even if you're not going to go do it yourself, chances are if you're already involved in gaming, you're being more and more involved in these kind of weird actual play, animation, live theater, <laughs> podcast yeah. experiments that are currently going on in the industry. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, to, to go back to, like, my own experience, uh, like, starting RPPR, uh, I was aware, I think even as early, there was this sort the scene, like, even began with podcasting itself. Podcasting began, like, in 2005, uh, and as far as I, as from what I remember, and the, the technologies were primitive, but there were, like, there was RPG, MP3.com, which I think is still around, and Yogsothoth. Dot com and they were recording games with very you know uh, re- simple recorders and I downloaded some and listened to some and I was like oh wow this is cool I'm like I could do this I could do this uh, better and I think my other motivation was not even just for an audience but for to record for my own sake because uh, I mean we've all had those great memorable games that then you're like oh man you had to be there you know like I know I've told the story of Tom's character in my first running of Massive Night of Lothotep, uh, where his character encountered a cultist and he figured it out while he was talking to the cultist in the cultist tea shop in the middle of day in London. And Tom's reaction was, oh, well, I'll kill him with my cane. And then <laughs> after beating him to death, uh, then I just had customers walk in and Tom was like, oh, and then he killed one customer. <laughs> and then when someone was calling in for the next customer, I think he killed the second person too and then ran away. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of surprised Tom didn't just stay there killing people as <laughs> yeah. he came in. <laughs> uh, and it was great because like I would – everyone at, I just had to tell everyone at the table to shut up to stop like coaching him like – no, no back, no rear seat player character in, in this. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's gonna have to figure this out. And I was like, oh, Tom's like, oh fuck, it was, it was, uh, and I wish I had recorded that. <laughs> um, and so with those kind of experiences, I started recording, experimenting with that. Um, and I feel we should talk in two thousand five. Well, that's when I started getting the like it, podcasting started two thousand five. I started getting the idea to I, my first recorded game. I think was two thousand seven. Uh, and I used with still dark times. Yeah, no, a very dark times. Primordial past. Yeah, uh, back when men were men and or it was women were women. It was two thousand seven or two thousand eight. People share with flip phones called razors. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! Uh, wait, was that the one, the one with side talking on it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, good times. Um, so this, I think I started recording around two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and that was more for my own sake than anything else. And I feel like. One first, we, I kind of want to do a little aside talking about the technology to do it uh, because it's a lot better than it was eight years ago. <laughs> uh, really? Yeah. Uh, th- now, a lot of the times you might think that uh, you need professional equipment to do that because uh, obviously when you see Critical Role and some of these others, they have like the mics with the little windscreens and everyone's wearing headsets and they're like they have, uh, you know, pole arms with the for the, the mics and everything. It's like uh, or boom arms or whatever. And it's very it looks very sound boards. And yeah, sound boards and stuff. mixers and all that other shit. Um, you don't need that. In fact, a standard smartphone can record a decent quality game. Um, there are re, um, apps that allow you to record, use them as audio recorders. Uh, I, in fact, the one game I recorded one game in China, uh, when I went there in 2014 with some expats and I used my cell phone for that and that's Call of Cthulhu July Park and I, I cleaned it up a little and, uh, you can see, you can listen to the quality and people like the game. Like there, there was a lot of comments on it. So I, I can tell that people could understand what was going on. Well, with yeah. the characters taking hallucinogens while fighting the mythos. Always a good idea. Yeah, always a good idea. And I got the 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 uh, um, reactions of how drugs affect characters so accurately, you know. <laughs> As we are very, very accurate in that kind of thing in general in our PPR. Oh, um, God. Somebody do a whip it and their yeah. skin fell off like they did crocodile or something. Uh, I think I gave people like bonus sanity for taking cocaine. Uh, what? Uh, I, it doesn't. It's the opposite. Well, I gave it like I, I had it like they actually lost sanity points, but they would get a like they gained sanity, but they, their role was at a penalty. So they would gain sanity points, but it would be easier for them to lose it in the future, I think. <laughs> Something Fair like enough. that, yeah. Uh, you do get that Russia courage, I yes. guess. <laughs> so um, I don't remember the exact thing, but like 
a standard smartphone now with an app and maybe a battery pack to keep it running for several hours is like in the middle of the table can get a basic quality game. Yeah. Uh, if you don't need want that, you can if you want to invest a little, you can get a Zoom H two N, which is what we use for actual plays, and that's about uh, one hundred sixty dollars. Memory cards are like a thirty two gig SD card is like ten fifteen bucks. Uh, and that'll record like 50 hours. And uh, we have some advice on the RPPR forums. If you have technical questions, feel free to ask there. But like the, the, the investment to record a good quality game is pretty minimal now. Now, if you're doing it online, it gets a little more complicated. Um, yeah. <laughs> a little more complicated. Uh, but there are still free solutions like uh, OBS Studio, uh, which is allows you to capture audio and video from your computer uh, onto a – and that's what I've been using lately. Like the Impossible Landscape campaign has been using that. Um, so uh, there, there's a lot of options. So don't think you can't do it because it's just too hard. It, it, it's a minimal hobby project, I think, to get serviceable audio quality. Now, obviously, if you want you know, CD professional audio quality, then you need a more investment in time and skills and blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, it also depends on what you're going to do with these games. Who are you going to – are you going to start a podcast or are you just going to share them with friends? Um, because there's a lot of different ways you can do this. So, um, like you could, uh, there's a lot of free services to upload, uh, sound files now, you know, Google drive, Dropbox, uh, you can even upload them to archive.org. Um, and, uh, so there, there, there are ways to do it on the cheap. Uh, but I mean, it's cheap, good and fast, you know, like you have to pick two out of three usually. Yeah. So um, think about what you what what are your goals of doing it? So you know, um, do you yeah. onion encrypt yeah. the MP3s through the blockchain? Do you packet switch the, the yeah. cloud? Yeah. Do you packet switch the? I uh, know much yeah. about technical things. Uh, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> You transcode the MP3 at uh, 320 <laughs> kilobits per second, uh, 44.1 kilohertz, or 48. Uh, so hack the Gibson. Hack the Gibson. Uh, hack the planet. <laughs> um, so yeah. So the, so don't think. Yeah. So that the the technical thing it, setting aside, it it can be done by pretty much anyone who already has like a computer or even a smartphone. I think uh, you you have the resources. Uh, to do it yeah and this isn't like the nightmare that is web hosting yeah. for posting the games just recording it is fairly easy you can yeah getting a podcast get up, a copy of audacity and yeah yeah audacity is go. free audio editing yeah. software uh there's a really great program called levelator which mm -hmm. can balance out audio levels pretty well I'll, i use it on basically every rpbr podcast now um you can uh and podcast hosting that's yeah, uh, another technical challenge because you have to get hosting. You have to then submit your podcast to like iTunes and other podcast directories. And But there are guides and tutorials out there that will show you how to do it. And that's if you want to go that far. Like yeah. You can just share the games like, oh, hey, I'm doing this, and just post it to a message board or something like that. Or share it with your friends or to a Facebook group or uh, whatever else. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's so technical. Those are just some of the technical issues, but those those can be solved. Those um, it should matter if you want to do it. So like, what are your goals for doing it? Um, I know some people just want to do it as a hobby to have fun. You know, some people like want to tell their story. They want to show off what they can do. Um, and then obviously, then there's the budding, you know, the, the burgeoning RPG designer slash podcast, you know, market where you podcast to promote your own, you know, self promote your own shit. Uh, We're monsters. Yeah, we are monsters. Uh, but there are also other issues beyond just the technical issues of like playing a game that's being recorded and meant to be consumed by other people. Uh, has some different requirements for both writing yeah. and playing uh, than a game that you're just having with your friends. Yeah. Most noticeably, you have to like tone down your extreme militant racism, <laughs> which I know we do here at RPPR. That's yeah. why we're an audio podcast, because we don't want our face tattoos <laughs> on all the videos, uh, which yeah. are rather extreme. Yeah, uh, exactly. But so, as anyone who's met us at Jim comments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Um, I mean, well, I think the thing is, I'll, one thing that I think I was very fortunate is that my my sort of default play style 
which was like, let's get to the fucking game. Let's do something. Let, I want something to happen. Uh, is suited for podcasts and not a lot of, but when talking to a lot of other gamers, I know there are a lot of podcasts or a lot of gaming groups out there that don't have that kind of style. It's more leisurely. It's like an all day activity. Um, you know, there's you're lo- switching between character voice and talking about food, yeah, and, and talking about work and kind shopping of. for your character's magical items. Yes, that's a big component, especially when you're doing a game with a lot of splat books, and you're like, oh. Well, let's see. What's the optimal character? Is that you know you're optimizing your character? Uh, so that's you know, if you're doing like a 12 hour game where it's like all you know all day, and uh, you know one guy, got, two guys go off to play Smash Brothers for two hours while the other people are doing something else in town. You know. That, yeah. Um, uh, which I'm going to blame you for one of my character flaws, uh-oh. which is going to be a theme the longer you have me on the main <laughs> podcast. Uh, but. Your uh, patience. <laughs> learning how to play in that style, yeah. I think that it might be why I am so allergic to uh, yeah. one of the reasons I'm so allergic to, uh, you know, hemming and hawing and, yeah. and uh, you know, dawdling and not getting <laughs> around to it. Uh, so, you know, I think the fact that you are very much here's the plot. Yeah. Now go <laughs> might be that when that doesn't happen, why my character is like starting a fire on the drapes just to like put a clock on this shit. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, but that is, is something you need because you don't yeah. want to him and haw and uh, get stuck in places to the point where like people call us on that sometimes in the comments like, yeah. when we are uh, meandering around the plot or dawdling or. Yeah, Anything like that. Uh, yeah, especially planning things out. Uh, so yeah, you, that's the other thing is like when you're recording the game, uh, your people are going to react to it uh, if they listen to it, you know. If they, and you want that uh, obviously because why? That's why you're doing it. Uh, but it may. It's not always going to be 100. percent You're the best ever. It's going to be you know constructive criticism that kind of thing. Yeah. And you have to roll with that. You have to like learn how to take criticism if you if you haven't already. Uh, you know, like this person makes a point, but that means I'm not trying to deliver it to the kind of thing that he wants, you know, so I just like, well, whatever, we're not doing, you know, dungeon crawl tactical combat and that's what he wants more of or, uh, or vice versa, you know, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's the game designer thing is like, you have to learn the difference between trolls, people who don't understand what your intention is and actual constructive criticism. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, for me, uh, like I've always wanted uh, – when I was – I wanted to run games because I wanted things to happen because I – as a player, I get impatient. I, I tend to get impatient because I would play in a lot of these games that were like, all right, here's – you know, the GM gets distracted and it's one of these all-day affairs. Yeah. And I just like – I want the thing to happen, you know. I mm-hmm. want I want something to happen because we, we – I just didn't get to game very much uh, or as much as I wanted and – so that kind of led to that habit, and it's like I, I have an idea. Here it is. Let's see how you react. Um, but for me, sometimes like the hemming and hawing can be interesting because it's character on character interaction, especially if the two players are doing a shtick that they like, uh, and I find it interesting. You know, Tom often does that with a lot of his characters interacting with other. You know, Tom and David, or uh, sometimes Tom and Aaron, or something like that. So. Um, but that's that's role playing. Yeah, yeah. And I don't. I, I'm not allergic to that. Yeah. I'm allergic to like. Well, we could do this, or yeah. we could do this. What do you want to do? <laughs> I don't know. What do you want to do? Yeah. I don't know. What do you want to do? I'm just like, oh my god. Uh, and then my character goes and licks the mythos monster or something <laughs> yeah. to wake it up and yeah. just get this shit on the road. <laughs> like, uh, so yeah, um, so yeah, you need to be focused. Uh, but not to the point where you cut off role or play. or edit. Like that's the other thing. You can do the twelve hour game, but like either edit in camera technically by like stopping and starting and stopping the recorder when you you know, like oh we're taking a meal break stop you know and then pick it up again or edit in Audacity or whatever you're using to edit the podcast. Um, we don't edit the podcast actual plays very much because again we're kind of a practice rehearsed thing and you know i just stop the recorder if we're gonna like oh someone's getting pizza or like we're taking a break um 
So, yeah, a lot of, we have sort of very formal kind of like, we're taking a break. That's it. A lot of players are like, we, you know, I've heard of game groups that like one person will just wander off for a while and come back. We don't really do that as a, a group. Like, no. Um, so, um, I have a question sure. about one thing. So, like, as a fiction writer and as me, <laughs> who is a horrible person in many ways, uh, I, you know, often take on the voices of like loathsome people because yeah. I'm writing a horror scenario or a noir scenario or something like that. Um, and then characters at the same time don't have to be like all chaotic good or anything like that either. Yeah. So, <clears throat> what I found in RPPR is that, and I didn't think about this until it started coming up. So, I have slips in the podcast that I'm kind of ashamed of. It's like, even if I'm role-playing a character who is loathsome and in the voice would be authentically loathsome uh, like to the point of like saying certain things that you would never say as a person i have to have trouble doing it because knowing that it's being recorded yeah i'm like okay well it's inauthentic to talk around this but at the same time it's my voice saying it no matter how much i'm trying to build this fiction in the world yeah so like uh at the same and I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about even necessarily like extreme examples like uh, racial slurs or something right. like that. But there are at times when I'm just, you know, thinking about character concepts and I'm like, uh, you know, wondering if like as much as I'd be interested to see that in the story, if that's something I am willing to role play. Does that ever like affect you with stuff that you're like willing to write? Like, you ever self censor, or perhaps was you uh, think about your recording it? Yeah, I th I think that that's definitely an issue. Um, certainly, I have shied away from certain ideas because I didn't think. It, I, well, I think the thing is that those, those kind of things I, I would I, I self censor, but I don't think it's specific to the the podcast per se because. I feel like they're interesting stories or they can be really horrific stories, but I don't know how fun they would be to actually play. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And I've, I've done that too. Yeah. Though not nearly as much as you as advocated yeah. by God's teeth. <laughs> Cause there are times that I've been like, well, this isn't going to be fun at all. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. I just think about it sometimes in terms of like, doing an authentic voice uh, i'm also like on there with like accents like yeah. all right if i'm painting pictures and i'm doing an accent like yeah. it, it's better at painting a picture with your words but i'm also bad at it i try i try uh, accents i mean you know i try accents i don't yeah i'm not very good at them either but yeah uh, but at the same time i don't want to be also offensive yeah like uh like i i did an online game of red markets and someone's like i'm taps a reference and like Okay, what's the reference name? He's like the Hungarian. He's got a very thick accent, and I'm just. All right. <laughs> I designed this mechanic. I have to do it, so I gave it a shot. It's probably horrifically offensive to Russians because I don't know what a Hungarian accent sounds like. So probably Hungarians too, as yeah. I made them Russians. <laughs> <laughs> nah. nah. <laughs> Uh, and basically got both wrong. Yeah. Um, and probably shouldn't have done that, but like, at, uh, but you know, at the same time, like you're goofing around with your buddies and it wasn't like, it was like, they all drink vodka and evil. Like, like they, it was yeah. a character and I just wanted to do something funny. Uh, so like, I often think about like, should I, if I want to do this kind of character for the point of like building up the world, Mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily have the skill to do it. I don't know, because I've never not been on the mic. Yeah. I don't know what my line would be with a group of people I'm sitting around. Yeah. In terms of, like, worrying about how well I can pull this off when I'm literally improv off the cuff. Yeah. Versus where my line is now in sort of self-censoring because I'm yeah. on a microphone. I... I, I, I Dude. And I don't think my role yeah. playing is worse for that. I yeah. think it's actually better for that. I think it's made me a better person. I think there's stuff I did in early RPPR that I'm not proud of and won't do again. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's just it's just something I consider because I've never had to like just sit around 
the game table in the basement with your with your buds, <laughs> and uh, no one's ever going to hear this again. Right. Uh, so I don't know what to compare it to. Right. Uh, I f- there's definitely an effect. I think I think there's I think it would be remiss of me to say you're not gonna like that's not gonna be in your head when yeah. you're playing. That that's definitely gonna be there. Um, but I don't think it's a bad effect. No. And I also don't. Uh, I can't quantify it because I've never seen the other it, side. It makes you more introspective of what you're doing. Like it, it makes you more mindful of what you're doing. And I don't think, yeah, I, yeah. Again, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. So it's a uh, morality is a glass house kind of thing. Like. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. If you're in public, you know you're going to be under your best you know, behavior. Yeah, best yeah. behavior. Um, I think. Um, I mean, the thing is, we we obviously aren't. It's not. I don't think a major effect. I don't think it's like, you know, it's not like in private. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, talking about, uh, you know, or being like, yeah, bringing up terrible offensive stereotypes or anything like that. Cause I wouldn't want to do that anyway. Cause I don't think that's fun. Again, it's for me, like, I feel like the Venn diagram between games that are fun and games that are podcast worthy. It's nearly a circle. You know, I think it's very, very, yeah. there's a lot of overlap between it. So I feel, and I think it's kind of a good cue. If you're doing something that people wouldn't want to listen to, it, what, what would people want to play but not want to listen to? You know what I mean? That, yeah. That, that's kind of the question there. And so, like, for you, I think that, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to go for. Um, and... I think there are – and the games that are like that aren't necessarily the ones with the, the offensive characters. It's the ones with like gameplay that's not fun to like listen to. Like yeah. if you're doing like a combat game and it's like 400 dice rolls you know, and that's it you know, and there's no character. And then that kind of makes you think. But I think – yeah. So. so yeah, like a, a less controversial thing to think about is the self-censoring issue. Yeah. And probably something we could speak about more because there's more examples of it is yeah. – Aspects of RPGs that don't translate to listening to someone playing RPGs. Yeah. Of which is most combat systems. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, why I think we minimize combat compared to a lot of groups that aren't podcasts. I think minim- minimize, we try to make it shorter in terms of actual length, which I think no RPG, very few RPGs actually have as a design goal. I mean, yeah. uh, because there's there's this idea of versimilitude, you know, like yes. you need to uh, simulate the reality of combat, whatever the fuck that is. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm scared. I shit myself. I die. Yeah. Then one other guy makes it. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> uh, well, hey, that's the Imperial. That's Are we the, all shot at each other? We're no doing one the, got the, hit. The, and the, then we ran away. Yeah. We're doing the 40K <laughs> RPG one, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, everyone gets a squad of guardsmen. Uh, <laughs> one guy makes it out. Um, so I think, but the, that's the thing is like only certain types of players are really into that. So, and usually I haven't met a playing group that everyone is the same type of player. Yeah, I think every every gaming group has sort of some sort of diversity of like this guy's in it for the that guy's the combat guy, but this guy's just here to socialize. This guy loves having fun. This guy wants plot and wants to role play, you know, or something like that. Um, and I feel like you you if you're you're trying to make some a game that's even if you add the game that's pure combat versus a game that's more varied, I think even the combat player will appreciate it because it's just not something he's tried before. You know, yeah. it's like you're, you know, I heard, um, I read a Neil Gaiman quote recently. It's like, your job as a writer is not to give people what they want. It's to give them what they don't know that they want, you know, like yeah. to give them something new. And I feel like this is kind of recording your game is going to, you know, that mental effort isn't necessarily self censorship. It's like realizing, oh, I you need to focus more on this shit. Yeah, um, and try I, something new. Like I know for me, I think it requires stuff that's probably just general good GMing. But I yeah. know, like especially when I get into like deep combat stuff, or the few times I've broken up the grid map. Yeah, I'm like trying to keep my language on the mic as much as possible uh, away from like rules when we can and either towards like meta commentary that might be funny yeah to at least somebody at the table if not 
other people all knowing the mic from. And like the we make a joke about immerse me, but like <laughs> uh, in combat, like when you're recording your game, it, you there is nothing less intriguing to listen to than <laughs> dice dice what if i move here and do that how does this rule work blah, blah, blah. and you do that for five minutes and then at the end of it it's like all right you did three points yeah <laughs> next round like it's just like oh like describe some blood or like yeah. some bullets smacking against the wall or steel clanging together like you need some sort of imagery in that, especially if people are listening to you. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think I'm good enough at that yet. Like, that's something I need to really up my game on, like, especially in combat scenes, because yeah. it's the only way to make it engaging listening. Like, you can laugh at it, too, which I think we also <laughs> uh, have, you know, every, yeah, yeah. every, uh, well, that's a different issue, but like, yeah, you got to make it more engaging than like dice, dice, hearing a miniature move around on a grid map and then. Like pages flipping as we consult rules text. No, I, it's it's definitely something I want to work on too because for me, I'm just like on my my poor limited mental capacity, just focusing on getting the rules right and like like figuring out what all the bad guys are going to do and just keeping track of all the shit. Like, there's no mental space left to like to give cool descriptions of it. So like, I feel like the next time I do a game that's combat heavy, I need to like incentivize players to write, give me descriptions for that kind of thing. That's yeah. why uh, That's why if you're going to pick systems, especially for yeah. being played, uh, that uh, if you a combat system that uh, encourages some sort of stunting yeah. is is way better and way more engaged. Yeah, like, but he, yeah, I mean, I ran Feng Shui too, and part of the problem was like, for me, I mean, part of it was just it was a new system, so I had to keep the rules straight, and I was like, what the fuck does all this shit do? Um, and even once I got that in there, I wasn't given as many cool descriptions as I could have because I was just, get, I, I wanted to do more. And I think someone in the comments called me out on like not giving enough cool descriptions. Yeah. Like, and I've listened to other Feng Shui 2 games in addition to yours. Cause yeah. like, you know, I freaking love, uh, martial arts, Hong Kong yeah, uh, yeah. or Japanese action movies Old school or Thai or like, yeah. Like Killzone Two, yeah, uh, Killzone Two, and I, 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 I love those things because they're they're awesome, and I think about how to do game design, and I look at Feng Shui too, and I'm like, it's really interesting, but it's still too mathy and slow for me. It's too like, complicated. It needs to be a rap battle with descriptions of violence, like. Yeah. Or you need to have, like, uh, artist reference mannequins, and you need to be, like, posing them at each other, like, playing with dolls I feel like you're just describing a new game to kickstart. Uh, yeah, I, I am, and I've thought about it, but, like, <laughs> uh, like you need to, like, minimize the math and make it as frenetic as fast as possible. Uh, but I'm like, well, you don't really, because you could do that with Feng Shui, too, but I'm very much thinking in the method of, like, on the microphone. Like, it should be... Not as great as Killzone 2. We're not going to aspire to that. But it should yeah. at least be as exciting in a scene of violence as that. Uh, there's stuff I don't know how to make the story work, as you know, all kung fu films operate off the basic idea of Morale. lone badass yeah. versus horde of assholes. It's not always the lone bad like, Or partner of badass yeah, 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 like, versus horde of assholes. It's very rarely three badasses versus... And then by four badasses, you got like... You know yeah. the four snake venoms, and like then now you're into some really old school Shaw Brothers <laughs> shit, and most people haven't seen that, and like that's not the style I'm going yeah. for, because uh, even those action scenes are 50 minutes of blocking and then an over dramatic death scene. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Like you just really have to up your imagery game when you're recording a combat uh, compared to what you may be doing in your game already but yeah. that's just good gming in general yeah so it's good advice all the way around but like i don't know it's just something that constantly bothers it's, me it's 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 like that's the thing is gming you're never it's a skill that you just spend your entire life like trying to get better at you know it's an, mm -hmm. it's it's nothing you really completely mastered there's always something new you can learn or some sort of technique um and i feel part of it is um just a choice of system matters. I think like Delta Green, the new Delta Green RPG, it's taken some big steps in that way, like lethality, like no more buckets yeah. of dice for heavy weapons, and also like 
it gunfights tend to be over real fucking quick. <laughs> real fast. Yeah. Like, it does not, like, I, I have no problem running gunfights or any kind of fight in Delta Green because it's going to be over in a few dice rolls usually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and perhaps the game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Which no. is a matter of choice. Well, Delta Green's another good thing because, like, they've linked sanity to role playing now, yeah. which is better listening. Yeah. Uh, much better listening. And then um, when I've gotten called out on like telling players how they feel, and I've stated how I feel about that, because yeah. like you don't get to choose your feelings, you to choose how you react. So yeah, I'm going to tell your player how you feel when you see yeah. a tentacled monster eat your mother. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to intrude on your agency in that uh, regard. If you but want, that's yeah. also a listening thing. Like, yeah. there's nothing more engaging than like tentacled monster eats your mother. 46 damage, do you say? <laughs> like, it's yeah. like, that's just so flat. Like, yeah. that's, there's no, no one listens to that. There's nothing great there. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to think of new ways to, like, describe emotions or describes emotions with images or something like that. Uh, and yeah. I feel like one thing for people who are like, oh, you don't choose your emotions. Well, you should read, like, there, there's a whole field of psychology about this. Like, uh, one book I can recommend is Predictably Irrational, which is about, like, why people aren't rational self-interest, like, consumers. It's a, talking about, like, economics. You yeah. Know, like, uh, but you can extrapolate, you know, that we – our minds are play tricks on us. Um, uh, and two, I feel like – yeah, I mean, like, part of it is collaborative. If you just say, oh, you take – 18 sanity damage from seeing your mother eaten by a dark young then like the player has nothing to work with like the the goal as a game master is to give your player a prompt that they can role play off of does that make sense yes yeah and i feel like that's sort of the trick here is like to make sure obviously it's collaborative and that that involves getting to your players and getting them interested because I know we joke about how every player at RP, every cast member of RPPR has their own quirks and mannerisms and style. Uh, but you can get surprising, like I, I, I guess performances would be the word out of it. Like Tom uh, was great when we played invasive procedures, which was a fear itself game set in a hospital. And he played an amnesiac young woman and he did a hell of a job role playing as her. Uh, because he had good prompts to work with, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I can do this. I can act scared. I can act, you know, uh, determined here, you know." And 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 it worked. Uh, and so a good game gives those kind of prompts and kind of lets people stretch out, you know, and try new things out. So uh, yeah. Um, so that brings me to another point. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking a lot about in character stuff. Yeah. But like, also, if you're being recorded, unless you are just a hard RP, never leave character podcast <laughs> youtube thing whatever which i've never seen um there's you're leaving good content at the table if you're not commenting on the game as you play it because in every natural game i imagine when you're just in your basement with your buddies there is an a plot with yeah. just like what is going on in the game Get the and pod. then there is a B plot where yeah. we're commenting on the game yeah which is sort of the beauty of delta green cuz you get these like dark dark nihilistic stories and then you get this even darker comedy off this dark nihilistic story as you as people comment on what your characters are doing uh like so for instance uh in baz's game where aaron tried to choke a nurse yeah. to death <laughs> and like as we're role-playing other care other people at the table are describing like what's going on in the background as you and Holly are role playing, and we're just like, yeah, no, no. there's alarms going off at the nurses' station. What about that? Yeah. A man wanders out from the drug room yeah. with a big pin shooting blood out of his neck. Like, it's, and it's like hilarious, like Ghost World stuff, like the fight scenes in the background with no sound, and that's great. So, like. I think you're losing a lot of comedy entertainment value, especially because you can't like there is such a thing as maintaining tone. And that's another thing you want to do on the thing. Right. But uh, if you're just going for entertainment value, like I think in some regard, like when people listen to RPPRAPs, we as people, as Caleb and Ross and Aaron and Tom yeah. are secondary characters like 
you know, we are characters. We're kind of the uh, chorus, the Greek chorus. Yeah, the Greek chorus. And that's an excellent way to put it. Like, and that's not a bad thing to include in your game because it's often like where your fun is, funniest yeah. memories come from. Like when I have to ask Aaron to, again, explain his plan <laughs> to make sure that he yeah. understands it. And then I realize he does. And then you can hear my soul die a little bit. <laughs> like, I think that's something that fans come back for. Yeah. To hear my soul die a little bit. Like, uh, <laughs> so... I uh, have to admit, that's like at least 20% of RPBR's uh, <laughs> popularity. It's just like, I hope you have a big soul kill. <laughs> like, yeah. You hope it's a renewal of resource? Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Uh, uh, we'll get your phylactery recharged. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, um, so it, it would be a mistake to say it's all in the game. Like, you definitely need to up your imagery chops. Yeah. And you definitely need to pick systems that are conducive to being listened to rather than right. like, being physically played at the table. But at the same time, like, don't neglect, like, your sort of commentary on what's going on. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. it doesn't even have to be funny stuff. Like, one of the best parts about the EP thing, uh, where you guys got ambushed in the subway tunnel. Oh, yeah. When all of your heavy hitters had chosen not to show up for that session. Yeah. Was like, I loved it because you listen to it because your characters are scared shitless <laughs> as they should be. And then you as players are also scared shitless and cussing Jason out. Like, <laughs> like where the fuck, the fuck did Jason come out tonight? And it really switched well between the role playing. Like, the theme was very well maintained because Bartleby was losing his damn mind <laughs> and like spraying gunfire down this hallway. And then Ross was like, that son of a bitch. And you're like <laughs> angrily texting him. And like, that, it was really good. Like, uh, so it's, it, it's not like the use of imagery to make a good to listen to is not a need to stay in character all the time, I guess I yeah. would say. Because that Greek chorus aspect, uh, I know when I listen to APs, is like one of my favorite parts of it. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that that is the, the, the key difference between this and like plays and movies. This is a game, like, and games are meant to be fun. You know, if you can't have fun at it, if you can't MST3K your own. Uh, game, you know, why you're... Yeah, playing. and you're MSTKing yeah. it as you're watching the theatrical release. Yes. Yeah. And, like, both of those are happening concurrently. Yeah. And that's sort of the brilliance of role-playing games. Yeah. And I really like APs that bring that out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I... The one thing I like is that... Uh, but at the same time, you do need to maintain tone. Yeah. Like, uh, within a certain degree. like uh, And everyone has to be on board with that. Yeah, so if, like, part one of God's teeth had gotten all wackety schmackety do Fraggle it would not Rock, have worked, yeah. it would not have worked. Yeah. Uh, now, there were some funny jokes we made about our, at a character's expense in God's teeth, but at the same time, you know, uh, you have to pick your spots on that. Um. Yeah, and uh, I, it, that's definitely true. And, and um, gun show guy, gun show guy. Example. Yeah, exa yeah, yeah. The whole gun show bit. You have to yeah. have levity. I mean, that, it's basic dramatic pacing. Yeah, and structure. Uh, and structure is really important. I think uh, more for these kind of games, and and it's helped me a lot as a game master. Is to like I like having like two to four hour games because it's focused, and you can tell a complete story or a complete chapter of a longer story. Um, and you have, I think it, it sort of forces me to, as a game master to do these kind of games are better if you kind of have like it solved before the players show up, like, you know, going back to combat, like one way to make combat better is to not make it like you're in a warehouse or you're in a dungeon, you know, or a 10 by 10 dungeon room and you're fighting monsters. It's, you know, you have to make it, you have to think more about the environment. You have to think more about the context of the fight. And, uh, and going back to game mechanics, choosing systems, not just like Delta Green, but I, I think Eclipse Phase has done one of the best jobs of making combat tense and exciting because of like the death spiral for characters, yeah. you know, wounds, and also like full auto and like the mods can make your character very powerful in combat, but they're also still relatively fragile. So, which I think fits the theme perfectly. And, but also like you're describing cool shit. Yeah. Like when you're in a close phase, like people are getting hit with microwaves and melting yeah. and shit's blowing up with plasma and dudes are getting you, cut up and with you, octopi with swords. Like yeah. you need to be describing that as much as possible. But you need to have those octopi Pie with swords like in the wings, you know, waiting. You need to have that like thought up ahead of time. Yeah, the stats. 
Uh, I know I improvise a lot of elements of the game, but I always have, like I've mentioned before, like the eco structure of the story in place. So, like, if this happens, I know this will be the reaction, and then like the players can go back and forth. And um, I always try and always try and put make the players have to make choices as much as possible, like meaningful choices. I think that that's kind of like where they're put in moments of crisis. Uh, is um, one one thing I think uh, that can help would be looking at rules of good of storytelling. Um, like I was reading the Pixar's 22 rules of storytelling recently. Yeah. And one of them is like, find out whatever your character is good at, make sure they have to do the opposite in your story. You know, like, mm-hmm. um, so like make the, and that that's kind of the crux of a good like crisis, a good conflict is like, oh, my guy's really good at combat. Well, yes, it's not necessarily like the guy who's at combat has to be, you know, good at social stuff, but like the honorable paladin has to make moral, you know, compromises in order to save people or, you know, th- th- those kind of things, you know? Yeah. What I mean? Yeah. So, um, I feel, yeah, that, that, that's sort of the key of, uh, doing this is making sure you have a good game plan ahead of time and making like everything dramatic, uh, in a, in a larger sense, like going above and beyond the kind of st- standard, RPG tropes. I mean, it's really like don't use the random dungeon table, random dungeon creation table in D anD D. You know, make it like a sky castle, as we mentioned in the last episode, yeah. or something like that, or talking to hallucinogenic frogs. You know, and or if or if you are doing that, like yeah. compensate with your sort of MSTKing your own game. Like, yeah, because I would love to listen to a game where they use the random roll table and try and fucking justify. <laughs> Two trolls living yeah. next to forty mummies, <laughs> living next to a griffin, and like all of eight hundred goblins in a single. And all of them are in like three rooms, <laughs> like sixteen feet apart from each yeah. other, and that's just how they live. Yeah. Like, like oh, the mummy chanting again. God, <laughs> like, like yeah, you, you MST three K RPGs. Like, yeah, that can still be entertaining to listen to, but like. Yeah, what part are you trying to make entertaining? The game, yeah. the commentary on the game, or both? Because yeah. you can do one or the other. Like, yeah. Like, uh, I, I love Dungeon Crawl Classic games, but I am not doing it for, like, inspired role play. <laughs> like, uh, I am doing it because I want to feed peasants into a meat grinder and <laughs> laugh at them. Uh, like, yeah. uh, and so, like, you get shit like Dove Spear, yeah. which doesn't make sense in any fictional context, <laughs> but is hilarious in a making fun of RPG context. Uh, yeah, and that's the thing. is Also, uh, as a game master, for if you're re- recording games, be willing to experiment more. Like, if I was not recording games, I would probably be sticking to Call of Cthulhu uh, and maybe like and a, a few other systems, and that's it. But like, I'm I'm constantly anxious we don't play enough because I, I know. know other people play more stuff than we do. Yeah. Uh, but even as I say that, I know that we play more stuff than ninety five percent of the gaming pop. Yes, yeah. like. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and I, I'm not calling us elite. Like, I don't know how one shot does it. Jesus Christ. Like, the time to read the books alone. It's so amazing. Um, well, I think isn't part of it that they get guest GMs, so they just have They to- do get guest GMs, but, like, they, they familiarize themselves with new rules quick. Yeah. Uh, or, or, like, uh, a lot of the IGDN people, like, are playing... Yeah. You know, a different game every week, stuff like that, and I would love to have them. And in fact, if I ever finish Red Markets, <laughs> I am going to need a sizable amount of time to refill the tank and just run other people's games and, like, yeah, you know, read some more rather than like just write as many words as I can between one hour and the next. Uh, but like, even acknowledging that, I know that just from like reading studies like in the RPG podcast kind of stuff and like talking to people at Gen Con is that, that we play like 95% like more right. than everybody else in terms of like amount of time we play and in terms of like variety of things we play. Yeah. Uh, uh, most people will play D&D or Pathfinder 
and uh, that's the probably the single. And that's industry. like a third of the industry, and that's yeah, it. that's all and they that, want. And, and they don't even play like third party fantasy stuff. And that, no. And then like the next third are like fantasy knockoff things, like Dungeon Crawl Classic. Well, I wouldn't say knockoffs, but you know, like variants, uh, like Dungeon Crawl Classics and that kind of thing, or like Shadowrun or World of Darkness, which is still big. And Whereas I'm still pissed, I missed Melissa's Agatha Christie mystery game. <laughs> well, uh, with bubble gum and shoe. I really, I really want to play bubble gum shoe, yeah. and I really want to play, uh, you know, a hill folk game that's yeah. like a cable drama, and I really want to do, you know, Puppet Land, in which we ha- can only play oh, for we'll one hour Land. and play puppets. Yeah, like don't worry, and, that'll but, be done. But um, I do think that if you're going to have your games to be listened to. There's sort of a push pull there because yeah. if you're known for playing different stuff, you have to play yeah. different stuff, and that's a branding issue. But if you're known for playing one thing, you have to play that one thing. And yeah. we, I think we kind of saw that with Faust because he's very good at playing and running Pathfinder. But I think when he came to RPPR, he didn't want to stop playing and running Pathfinder, <laughs> but he desperately wanted to play anything else but Pathfinder for a little bit. And yeah, yeah, but like, it's not like he's going to shut the podcast down. Yeah, or like he hates Pathfinder now. But like, yeah, he, you know, I mean, and they're not eat even chocolate real. for a year. You really want some vegetables, like yeah. you know. Uh, so, um, I mean, and he, I mean, it's and they're doing the house rule like it's so different from Pathfinder. It's basically a different fantasy system at this point. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, that's the same kind of thing. And um, the, these are kind of like unresolvable problems. Like these are just things you kind of like. You, there's no clear solution. You just have to choose what you want. Uh, I mean, we we our backlog of games grows <laughs> every, and people are always asking us, "Do you want to play this? Do you want to play this? Uh, when are you going to play this?" And I was like, "I don't know. We have to get through the things that were on my bookshelf right now." <laughs> Um, but it's just kind of the nature. Yeah, of as of right now, I, I desperately want to play Unknown Armies. Uh, oh yeah, the new edition. I want to play Hillfolk. Yeah. I want to play. I want to play Hillfolk for years. God, I want to play Night Witches yeah. so bad. Uh, and but like then I'm also like thinking podcast wise, like well, Night Witches will be really cool, but it's an apocalypse world hack, and so we already have apocalypse world games. So should we yeah. try a completely new system? Like I, I want to play Spark. I want to play Sig. Like there's, I got a shelf of stuff from Gen Con two years ago. I haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, because I exactly. have no restraint and buy everything that looks shiny. <laughs> um, I have board games I haven't played yet. Like yeah. just because we got one or two board dealing games. with a full time job and yeah. running a publishing company doesn't allow for a lot of time. Yeah. But um, I do think it's a branding issue. Like. Is is your brand going to be playing different games? In which yeah. case, you're never going to feel like you're playing enough new ones. Yeah. And then, is your brand just doing this one thing? In which case, you know. Yeah. You I feel I feel like thing. sometimes we play like when we step out. We're like we're kind of more known for Cthulhu ish kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and when we step out of that, we don't get as much like feedback from uh, listeners. So. Uh, there's definitely that that kind of issue. I mean, we're still we're still going to keep doing that and trying new systems out, uh, but it's kind of yeah uh, it's, yeah we definitely have a horror brand. Yeah. So you know, new horror game comes out, we're more likely to bump that to the top yeah. than say I don't know your uh... Papa Land. Well, Papa Land's kind of horrific. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. Uh, upwind, um, yeah, uh, yeah, upwind, or like I was thinking, like uh, your Ruitama, your yeah, Ruitama, like yeah, yeah. that's probably going to go on the back burner. Yeah, if you're just thinking from a pure what do people want to listen to perspective, right? And of course, we always listen feedback from listeners. Uh, if you do have comments or questions about that kind of thing, uh, please let us know. Uh, so we, yeah, like tabletop's not going to get to run a campaign of any RPG they play, even if they fucking love misspent youth. They're not going to be able to spend yeah every episode five episodes on yeah, it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, you do you do sort of hem yourself in with your brand eventually. Yeah. Although I don't think that's something to think of when you're just thinking about starting to record your brand, to record your games. I think eventually that's probably got to be something that affects people if you're just again used to doing whatever the fuck we want in our basement. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, and and again, this comes back to like, why are you doing this? Are you doing this for you know podcast fame or uh, just for your own satisfaction? If you're doing it for your own satisfaction, I mean, you're like let your let your muse carry you, you know, uh, inspire you, uh, let the spirit move you, as they say. So, um, yeah, um, at this point, I feel like we should just wait. Like, what questions do people have about this kind of thing? And um, it. Because it's a big issue, and it's it's very fun though. Like it's a very it's a fun. It can be rewarding. Um, we have uh, a forums, a message, uh, and a Facebook group, so you can comment. Um, those are ways to promote your own podcast, or if you have something like that. Um, but yeah, I feel that's pretty good. So uh, when we go uh, at some point, I will be creating new podcasts just for reviews, but we're still doing shout outs because I haven't gotten around to setting up the new site yet. So we'll have shout outs and maybe an anecdote. So we'll be right back. And we're back uh, with whatever vaporwave or synthwave I uh, put in there. Uh, it might have been va- synthwave, so you know, you know, you you you're your code synthwave. I am. I feel like now <laughs> you've assured it to be vaporwave. <laughs> it's just whatever, this, however the spirit moves me. So, uh, but anyways, let's get to some uh, shout outs. Uh, first off, obviously, Puppet Land. Uh, this is a very cool RPG. Um, it is very beautiful, and I've written two scenarios for it: uh, the rhyming ritual and the fact overnight at the factory, I believe it's called. Um, and the rhyming ritual, in fact, was inspired by the first uh, adventure of Dungeon World you ran, Caleb. Oh, <laughs> nice! Uh, so, because the whole thing is like maybe there, there's a magic ritual. If you keep rhyming for the entire hour, then uh, something special will happen. Uh, but you know, Punch isn't gonna like it, so he's gonna try and stop you guys. Uh, so we'll have to do that. Obviously, <laughs> just throws oranges at you. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I deal with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What just fell from the sky? Yeah. Blorange. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's it's out on PDF and in print now. So uh, take it, give it a look. Um, it'll definitely if if it doesn't get a, yeah the any nomination for best art, I just I, I don't know. Like, um, I mean, I, obviously it'll be up against Pathfinder, so Pathfinder will pro- probably win. But you know, in the non Pathfinder category of RPGs, I think this is one of the most beautiful RPGs to come out. Uh, this year, so yeah, very cohesive art style too. Oh yeah, yeah, no, very consistent. Um, As a guy who's trying to art direct a cohesive art style <laughs> at a big book and failing, oh, uh, despite the high quality of my artists, yeah, uh, so it's all on your shoulders. Is what you're saying? Yeah, uh, I am so impressed by books that look like they were done with one hand, which yeah. is very impressive. <laughs> Um, Which I would do if I could, but you know, it would kill Kim or Patsy or yeah. basically anyone. I they're, yeah, they're doing they're doing their best. And yeah, it's, it's really it's just on it's all on you. Um, okay, you've been reading some uh, novels recently. Uh, so I finished the Ben Winters uh, Last Policeman series. Yeah. Uh, which uh, I is very good and I highly recommend. And I did so before. Uh, so if you didn't listen to that, the Ben Winters Last Policeman series is a detective. Uh, series of three detective novels uh, that are, I guess they're, I don't know if I would categorize them as mysteries or noirs. Like, there are procedurals, but it is, like, during an existential crisis. crisis. Uh, so, basically, uh, they find out an asteroid is going to hit Earth. Like, absolutely certain going to hit Earth in a certain amount of time. Um, and there is literally nothing anyone can do about it. They can't get, it's like six miles wide. Like it's Dunzo. Like, and it's not Dunzo for like humans. It's Dunzo for like life on earth. Like everything's going out. Um, and so the main character is a guy named Henry palace who always wanted to grow up to be a detective. Uh, and after his first year as a beat cop, he becomes a detective because all of the other detectives are going bucket list like everyone else 
because what is the point of keeping society together? Because uh, people learn this is going to happen for like two years out. <laughs> so like uh, there's denial, there's cults, there's conspiracy theories, uh, and it's all very good. But um, there's new mystery in every book, um, and not and what I love it's it's not like like the conspiracy of the government to right. like escape or anything like that. Like that's hinted at, but they're mysteries. Like in the first book, Henry Pellis finds a guy who's hung himself in a mcdonald's bathroom uh well what used to be a mcdonald's bathroom until all the employees quit and yeah. it became a different small business um and he realizes the guy didn't hang himself but it was staged like a suicide but literally no one wants to investigate it because what the fuck's the point and almost everyone is committing suicide <laughs> like Jesus. they're fighting suicides every day but he's just like he's like a a fucking Camus hero. Like, he's yeah. an existential hero. He's like, I find meaning. I am a policeman now. My purpose was always to be a policeman. I can be a policeman now. I will be a policeman. It's like, no deeper concerns. Like, he's sad about the end of the world, but he's not too worried about it. He doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have kids. He doesn't have attachments. He wants to be a cop, and now he gets to do it. And so, like, that's it. Like, the fact that he has nine months to live along with everybody else on Earth... It bothers him, but, like, not more than academically because he's got work to do. <laughs> and it's just, like, it's just so beautiful in that regard, even as it is just, like, utterly nihilistic. Um, so the, that one's very good. Uh, then there's Countdown City, which is the second novel, which takes place later. And I just read the third one. So I think, like, the first one's, like, s nine to six months out or something like that. Uh, the second book's about half that, and this last one is two weeks left, and society has basically collapsed. <laughs> uh, like, it is a post-apocalyptic world, but it's like if the guy in the Mad Max book, like, came up to you with, like, a notebook and was asking you if you've seen this person. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, uh, it's just so beautifully kind of absurd yeah. uh, and ridiculous, and I, I really like it. Um, and it's kind of heart-wrenchingly beautiful at the end of it. But the best part of it is that even with the timeline remaining consistent throughout the whole books, um, like there's twists in book three that are set up in book one. And it's sort of masterfully like arranged. And like it was a really satisfying conclusion for like something in the book that I thought was going to be a gaping plot hole or like – some unresolved ambiguity skip out becomes like a holy shit i didn't see it the whole time <laughs> uh so i won't ruin it but uh like really highly great twist highly recommended solid three novels uh what a, a great way to take on a noir story that's not hacky right, uh, right that is it was i thought they were really well done interesting uh do you have those in paper or you i got them in paper Ooh, i might have to borrow those um, cause I just recently got, uh, a novel invisible cities by, uh, Calvino, uh, yeah. heard good things, but I haven't read it yet. So no, it's, it's very much like a, uh, what is it at the beach, gone to the beach. Oh yeah. At the beach. Yeah. The, the one where the nuclear winter is it's like, coming to Australia yeah, in six yeah, yeah. months. It's very much that with a mystery involved. Yeah. Like, and like they do it well, it's, it is very much like. In many ways, it's more restrained than on the beach. That's it, on the beach. Okay. Because, like, on the beach, they still get in the sub and they go look for other people. On it's yeah. like very much like we can thrillery do in the sub. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. can do it at some point. And this one's like, no, it's you're done. Like, yeah. Everyone's gonna die. <laughs> and like most people, like immediately aren't like, you know, let's go murder everyone. Crazy yeah. societal collapse. Most people are like, well, I guess I better go to work. But like, it slowly peters off. Like, this is how the world ends. Not with a bang, with a whimper. Yeah. Uh, but like, as a heroic character, Henry Palace is like the Atticus Finch of mystery <laughs> novels. Like, because he's just like, yeah. Well, I mean, just because bad things are happening doesn't mean you get to do bad things to people, and there's still <laughs> law. And so I'm going to go out and find criminals, for I am a detective, and it is my purpose. And it is just like, and he never gets that philosophical about it because he is a cop. He's got cop brain, yeah. but like just from the sidelines, you're just like, 
fuck yeah <laughs> like yeah man not all heroes have capes like yeah, yeah he's just really cool so nice i uh i will definitely have to read that now um speaking of existential crises uh i watched uh, a couple movies uh while i was in peru uh, on my tablet uh one of which i know you will love because you uh a sorcerer because we've talked about it on the podcast before uh the 1977 william friedkin movie uh soaring roy uh rob Schne- uh, roy yeah, Schneider. you really need to correct the work yeah. of that hack Desson. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Rafifi, what a piece of shit that was. Uh, wages of Fear, like the French Hitchcock, screw that guy. This one's got Roy Schneider in it. Uh, William Friedkin's got some uh, directorial chops. We will disagree on this. <laughs> you- I just unshout out, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Soundtrack by Tangerine Dream, I mean... Uh, God, that's awful! <laughs> <laughs> you don't like prog electronic. The soundtrack experiment. for that movie should be by Philip Glass. <laughs> like it should just be discordant sounds. Yeah. Uh are like uh metal machine music or something. <laughs> like it's a grading film. Yeah. You don't want tangerine dream. Well, they it's it, it's pretty uh I liked it. I thought it was quite enjoyable. It's about four desperate men in South America who are hired uh, have one last chance to make a big payday because they're all exiles. They're all like wanted uh, by other criminals or the law, uh, and they are trying to deliver this load of unstable dynamite to a uh, uh, a site so that they can because uh, an oil well has been blown up and they need the dynamite to uh, close the well uh, and restart the the drilling and uh, of course you know it's unstable sweating dynamite and it's over treacherous you know yeah. uh, jungle terrain and uh, it's a it's a character study about like these four desperate men who you know can't trust each other and have nothing to lose but uh, and uh, what they're willing to go through in order to you know uh, survive. And it's uh, it's I mean quite beautifully shot, you know, very uh, and uh, like all things that yeah. offend me, yeah, I'm going to try and distance myself from it academically. <laughs> uh, so Sorcerer is actually pretty integral in New Hollywood, yeah, because uh, Fried- oh yeah, it was a failure because Friedkin came up with like uh, you know Coppola and all, all mm-hmm. those. He guys. was one of the yeah uh, American New Verite, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and then. It's released in 1977, mm-hmm. the like I think weeks before Star Wars. Yeah, and it just gets crushed into non-existence. And it was very expensive to make. And it was very expensive to make, but it was like a no-brainer win when they made it in Hollywood because we're talking like, you know, Godfather era. We're talking like Kubrick. Mm-hmm. We're talking like these kind of heady art films. And then Lucas comes in with 1977 Star Wars and completely changes the entire formula of Hollywood forever. And then you get, like, the reign of Spielberg. Yeah. Um, So in a lot of ways, at least historically, Sorcerer is, like, the death of, you know, the nouveau art. That and Heaven's Gate. Yeah, that and Heaven's Gate is... uh, Heaven's Gate's obviously the more notable of the two because it's four hours long or something. Really it was good. like an artistic failure as well. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Sorcerer was not super well received when it was, came out, but it's like, it's, yeah, I like. I thought it was a good movie. It's a, I think you would like it too. It's yeah. competently made. Yeah. I've seen it. <laughs> I just, I'm offended by the fact you're like, oh, like Sorcerer. Yeah. <laughs> Which you do to troll me. <laughs> Uh, I still haven't seen Wages of Fear. That's the problem. God, man. I've seen Rafifi, all right? I haven't seen it. Man. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I'm not opposed to seeing Wages of Fear. Uh, And I'll have you know the original novel is preferred sorcerer to the the original uh, Wages of Fear movie. (laughs) We're not talking. I'm not not doing this. I'm distancing myself. Uh, Yeah. No, it's fine. Uh, I will say... Yeah. Sorcerer, an important film for how historically it failed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that bridge scene. Though. Caleb Stokes, 2016. Yeah, no. Quoting it. <laughs> and you have to admit, those trucks look badass. Uh, it's very post apocalyptic. Uh, you know. The, I, the one thing I will with Sorcerer is they added in the, uh, the rope bridge scene. Yeah. 
which is pretty yeah. nerve wracking. Uh, but you know, it's there's also parts. Of, I mean, I can't remember. Is Sorcerer have the platform scene at the tight turn? Uh, no, no, it doesn't have that. Yeah, see, I'm against replacing that with the rope scene. Uh, but that and they kept the oil, right? Like yeah, the bathing that, yourself. That's where in they're oil. Go, going to. Yeah, uh, the bathing yourself in oil, like submerging yourselves in oil. No. Oh shit! You got to see Wages of Fear, man. I it's been forever. I didn't see Source. I saw Sorcerer first as a kid. Yeah. And my hippie dad's like kind of rocking out to the Tangerine Dream. Yeah. Like, Why are they in trucks? Uh, so I don't remember a lot of it, but like Wages of Fear has some scenes that are like, because like instead of the rope bridge scene in Wages of Fear, they have to go up a hairpin turn. Yeah. But it's a hairpin turn on the mountain, so they know that no, almost no vehicle can clear it, and especially and these deuce and a half trucks aren't supposed to clear it. So what they did in the mining platforms is they just built this dock off the side of the mountain out of wood. Oh, that's stable. Like, <laughs> held up with, like, two uh, two triangle, like, rafter yeah. beams. And so, and then, uh, like, cables up top where it's rooted in the stone. And so what they basically have to do is they, they have to get the truck to it. They have to back it up onto this, like, wooden platform it barely fits on and listen to it groan and creak. And then they have to try and get off of it. But then it ends up that the wood is muddy and rotted, so they start spinning, and then the tires start spinning out as, like, the cables are getting ready to break, and it's just, like... Very nerve-wracking. Freaking nerve-wracking. Jesus. Uh, so, Wages of Fear is the better fetch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will, when I see it, I will be able to... Uh, I'll, I'll have to track that down. Uh, and we can do a future uh, shout-out about that. Um, but, uh, I know you've been playing, uh, so another, you've been participating in some historical media. <laughs> uh, uh, so I started playing Battlefield one. Yeah. Um, so I got it cause of the world war one angle. Yeah. I've never played a battlefield We've done game enough before. Clancy games. We're kind of obligated. Yeah. Uh, I've never played a battlefield one game before, uh, battlefield game before yeah. to be clear. And then I also didn't know it was that close to call of duty. So I am super fucking bad at it. Like epically terrible we're talking like one kill per 32 minute match just dying over and over again but the campaign is really really well written especially the uh the tank mission the one about black bass and they're they're all pretty good um and then i've never seen a game that is simultaneously so well researched and so inaccurate <laughs> like uh, they do that. I'm guessing that Hollywood thing where like every weapon, every uniform is like perfect, but like what they do with these things is like what the fuck is going on? Well, no, it's like they'll take like shit that uh, was like in prototype stage. Oh yeah, and everyone has that gun. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, there's tons of machine guns and repeaters and stuff like that, and most of the bolt rifles are only the snipers. When in reality, like, everyone has a bolt rifle. Yeah. And there's very few clip-loaded things yeah. on the actual battlefield. But, like, all the weapons do exist yeah. to the point where they even include the world's smallest pistol in there because it was invented in 1918. And you can go into multiplayer with that bitch, and it is hilarious because <laughs> it looks like you're holding a teacup. <laughs> And it takes her, and it's so funny. Uh, but that's a high-level unlock. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so they have all this stuff that was from the time period, but then they also have stuff that works. So like the the first the first story mission is no, I think it's the third story mission is the Italian front and it's many wars ago. Like you're fighting in the Alps. It's like that glancy movie, but you start off with like we were a special unit. I was lucky cuz I was one of the armored men and like he's in the armor. Yeah. And it actually works. Like, it's bouncing weapons up instead of just feeding them into machine gun fire to die. Uh, so, but it's fun because, like, you're like a buff big daddy on the battlefield, and that's a big thing you can get on the multiplayer maps. Uh, so, like, everything exists in there, but, like, the way they use it is just, uh, like, it's so insane over the top. It's uh, pretty ridiculous. Probably the most accurate mission is... Um, 
uh, the first mission, the one you kind of use to like in the tutorial for the story mode, is uh, you play the Harlem Harl Fighters yeah. uh, versus the Germans on the front line, and it is notably hellish. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm super bad at it, like super super bad. But uh, the World War One angle, it works. It's interesting. There's like diverse ground. Uh, bayonet charges are super powerful. Like they're an instant kill, but like they're hard to hit. Uh, and like you can get into melee combat, and you can get. But you turn on shelling, and there's gas. So it's a very interesting uh, gamification of a war that's not typically gamified. I guess they had to just, do it sooner or later. Yeah, yeah, more than just sitting around in a trench. Yeah, uh, which you know is most war. Yeah, regardless of when it happens. Uh, but um, yeah, it's it's an interesting game. Uh, I definitely like it more than your typical COD stuff because there is some weird historical stuff in there. Yeah, but, um, yeah, it's very well researched at the same time. Like you meet Lawrence of Arabia, stuff like that. Mm. So uh, it's it's fun. Worth it for the campaign for a rental, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then if you're actually good at it, maybe good to buy. But right, I do not party up with me. I suck. <laughs> uh, one thing, um, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it's it does sound quite entertaining. Um, but um, what was I was going to say. But anyways, uh, I have another movie from the '70s that I watched uh, while I was uh, you know on a plane. Uh, to Peru, uh, on my tablet, uh, and this was Logan's Run, uh, the original, the the only, except no substitute. So you brought these movies, like, because yeah. you were feeling funky, right? Yeah. This isn't just, like, what they had as options. Oh, no, no, no. Right. I brought, they, they don't fucking have that on Like, I'd part. fucking freak out if I was flying oh. to Peru, and it was like, you could watch Logan's Run, <laughs> our sorcerer. And then, like, you see your fro, and the Langoliers <laughs> are chasing you. Uh, like, I'd be like, what's fucking happening? Yeah, no, no, I chose this, because I'm me, and I'm weird. Uh, I did watch some big Hollywood movies. Uh, I did watch Keanu on a bus to Arez, uh, Peru, as the, going from midnight to five. 5 a.m. winding through mountain roads. It was subtitled in English uh, and the, 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 it was dubbed in Spanish. So I think it uh, were some of the jokes lost. Some of the jokes I think were lost, but I got a sense of the plot. So that movie was pretty funny. It, it, it seemed I got the idea. Uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, Logan's Run, uh, which I, you know, I knew the concept of years and years ago, but I never actually watched it. So I go, well, I better get this out of the way, knock this out. And it's a weird fucking movie, especially like once they start running, you know, uh, the, like I did not expect the ice cave, uh, at everything that happened after that. That was, uh, it was pretty entertaining. I felt my Logan's Run story. I've seen it before, but yeah, it did been a while. And like, I like to show my kids weird stuff like oh, when yeah. i have to show a movie like i'm not gonna show like the latest young adult novel i'm gonna show yeah. something like weird i think last time i had to show him a movie to extend it test i had i made him watch the fall <laughs> <laughs> like the tarsum Singh movie wow because <laughs> i'm just like well it's pg-13 we're good. Uh, so I one day I brought in Logan's run, and I'm like, I should probably watch this. It's been a while. I'm like, oh, titties in the first five minutes. Real, real glad I didn't show that. Yeah. Uh, those are some sheer tops, the ladies in the Logan's run. Uh, oh, the were. 70s. Yeah. Uh, real rough. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Yeah, no, it's a weird fucking movie, and I, I enjoyed it. But it gave me an idea for doing like, because you know, obviously, it in the movie ends obviously with the arcology being overthrown and like all the survivors going to the surface, like ah, oh, ah, oh. and they <laughs> see an so, old. It's so seventies. It's so seventies, and they see an old person for the first time, and the old person's just this like eighteen nineties prospector <laughs> cat man, uh, cat lady basically, uh, and it's quite entertaining, but. Um, I was just thinking, who the, look, the the AI is blown up. Who's going to make all their food now? Like <laughs> these guys are all a bunch of useless tits. All they've been doing is doing like hologram tender and drug <laughs> and drug orgies for like you know twenty years. Like they're not going to know how to do shit. They're going to really regret this in about two years. Like I don't want to have an extra thirty years of hard work. Fuck this. I want thirty years of drug orgies. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
But what it gave me the idea for was um, Dungeon Crawl Classics. Uh, Goodman Games recently did a Kickstarter for Mutant Crawl Classics, and we did an actual play of their preview adventure, which is basically the same thing, but in like Thundar, their barbarian slash 1970s post apocalyptic sci fi weird world. So um, I have an idea for a campaign. And uh, so the book's not, the PDF's You're not. Going, you just, are you going full heavy metal in it? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. No. It, <laughs> Uh, it's gonna be sandbox. So like the, the concept, we're writing cheetah birds yeah. through the magma geysers. Oh yeah, Philarion. Oh yeah, no, it's gonna be with fu- our perms yeah. flowing in the <laughs> fucking breeze. I'm gonna be a fucking animal mutant, man. I don't give a shit. Um, so the PDF's not out. So this is a ways off. But the the concept is is like like you know one generation after. The ecology, you know, rose up and like the survivors are getting by the best they can. Uh, But some but they find out some certain doom is coming. Something is going to totally wipe them all out unless the certain doom is stopped. And the way the game mechanics would work is you have your village and there's going to be 100 potential PCs that, you know, able bodied, able bodied villagers that you can take out. And so it'll be a bit like XCOM. So you can take out, each player can take out four at a time. <laughs> They're all level zeros. <laughs> and then like what I do is I'll pop, I'll show you a map and there, there all, there'll be some clues and they'll lead like two or three places. And each one's going to be an adventure, but I'm not going to tell you what level range each one is for. So like you might go to the level one, uh, zero adventure and like be able to level your guy, or you might walk into the level ten adventure and like get creamed. And so like the idea is you have to build up, you have to figure out what the 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 adventure path is. Uh, while losing characters all along the way. I love this idea. And then, like... Can I add something to it? Sure. All right. Can the adventures be summarized and their plot entirely dictated by (laughs) album covers and van art? Oh, to the yeah. Point where, like, we just throw a shit ton of yes covers in an imager <laughs> yeah, file yeah. and we just hit, like, shuffle. Yeah. And that one comes up. That's the one we're playing that yeah. week. Uh, just, like, some crazy, trippy ass 70s. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, black light posters. I'm going to be watching a lot of 70 sci fi movies <laughs> as preparation. And yes, uh, yeah, black light art, you know. It's also going to be really funny as these people get killed by. Just shitty looking monsters. Oh yeah, just <laughs> there's going to be a lot of shit. trash cans with shit stapled. To them. But here's the thing: <laughs> shooting so, lasers. So here's the thing: there's going to be like XCOM style management, where like you you send out your four villagers, two come back, they're now level one. Now you can take those both those level ones out and two level zeros. But out. you're going to lose them in the level ten. Yeah, so you have to manage your guys and like level up your dudes along the way. So maybe you. <laughs> Uh, and if you everyone loses a hundred, if you know the entire group has a hundred PCs between them, <laughs> so if all hundred die, then the village is doomed. Shit, can we like cap Aaron or something? <laughs> no, he'll go through eight a game. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there will, there will be mechanisms to balance it out. Like if you take one guy out, he'll get more bonuses because he's, you know, there'll be the inverse ninja law. So if you have four guys, you get four guys. If you have one guy, he's going to be better <laughs> off because they'll have bonuses to his role. Uh, so I haven't figured out all the mechanics yet. So this uh, is less a shout out and more Logan's Run gave me the best idea ever. Yeah, basically. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, it's a good movie too. I think you should watch it because yeah. it's fucking nuts. Renew. Uh, renew. <laughs> See, I thought the ending of it was going to be like they sneak back in and they do carousel and like sabotage it to like show the way, you know, to show them the truth. Uh, I thought they were going to do that again, but no. <laughs> Are they going to like say renew ironically now? Oh, yeah. Like renew. <laughs> say so all like huddle in their little <laughs> dirt village. <laughs> it's going to be in the ruins of the arcology, you know, like they're not going to be like, well, or maybe it'll be in the Capitol building, you know, with all the Parliament of Cats, which we ate once <laughs> until they mutated into cat people and then we waged war on them, then we made peace, then we intermarried with them and now we just did the in-laws so we kind of like, eh. Uh, uh, the 70s were a weird time. Yeah. Uh, speaking of weird, uh, the other thing I was watching a lot of uh, on the flights and trips on Peru uh, was JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, uh, which is a crazy anime series where a lot of the characters are actually named after rock metal. Uh, like there's a character named Led uh, Count Zeppelin for Led Zeppelin. Uh, there, Dio is another character. 
Uh, yeah. I don't want to meet that one. No, he's the bad guy, uh, actually. <laughs> and uh, Wham is another one. Uh, ACDC. Wait, are you equating Wham <laughs> and Led Zeppelin? Yeah, they're, well, their character's named like in Led, and Wham is a villain. Well, I just want to be clear that that's JoJo's mistake, not yours. <laughs> Wham is a villain. Uh, Led Zeppelin uh, was a hero. Uh, <laughs> ACDC was another villain, though. Um, and yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So it's I can't even explain the plot because it's like generational. Like every uh, arc of the story follows one generation of the JoJo family, starting like the Victorian time. So like Jonathan Joe's star has to fight his, Dio, his rival, who becomes a vampire. And then the next generation, in the or like two generations later in the 1930s, um, another Joe Star has to fight, uh, well, crazy vampire predators from you know 10,000 years ago. And then now fast forward to Japan in the modern era in the 80s, where Dio has come back to life and they have to kill him again. So it's <laughs> typical anime insanity bullshit. Uh, <laughs> Fair and, and uh, so it's quite fun if you want to see the shonen thing of like, aha, my move will defeat you. Has, has anyone started a YouTube channel called Explain Anime to Old People? <laughs> Holy shit. Why haven't we done that yet? We didn't do that yet. Is. Like just every week, Aaron's like playing Zach Galifianakis in a, a Between Two Ferns. Oh my God. And we just roll in a random person we borrowed from the home. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god and we're just god. like uh van helsing go yeah and we just back away helsing, yeah. yeah we just back away and let it happen yeah oh my god <laughs> oh. <laughs> podcast is over we have work to do yeah Beep. you gotta go monetize that shit <laughs> um and finally uh, i do want to give mentions out to uh pathfinder speaking of them um, as we did earlier in the uh, thing, uh, Paizo has been sending review copies of some interesting things. Uh, horror adventures. Uh, is there a new supplement? And uh, I, when we start the review podcast, I'll give a more detailed review of this with uh, Bill. Um, they have rules for sanity, mechan- yeah, sanity, horror, uh, Lovecrafty and stuff. Uh, if you want to add horror to your fantasy adventure, this looks like a good book to do it. Uh, and they also re- recently like published the core books for Pathfinder, the core... Uh, rule book and the bestiary as like soft cover books at like half the size and like they're twenty dollars each so you don't need a big fifty dollar book anymore you can just get the twenty dollar soft cover version it's the exact same content just cheaper now so that's cool yeah um give them money they're really you know they're really struggling <laughs> yeah Faizo is doing so i mean those storage units to hold all their innies <laughs> that's a monthly expense yeah that's a warehouse now <laughs> they just have the they just have it they, they have climate control you that's know. actually technically a separate company now just yeah, yeah. called any storage yeah but you know they're a subsidiary oh yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, they're dependent on the mother company. <laughs> um, and then finally, uh, as we, we mentioned before, uh, Baz, uh, our PBR listener, came here to run uh, Delta Green for us. Uh, me, Caleb, Aaron, and uh, Holly. Holly. And uh, it's a Patreon backer. Uh, every once in a while when we have a special or a unique game, uh, I make it available to the $5 level backers and above. Uh, we did a Sean Rand Slasher flick. flick. Uh, a couple months ago, and that was the first game like that. So anytime, so there's no schedule for these. It's just whenever we get a special AP, I'll post it on there. And sometime, maybe in like a year, I'll post this publicly. You know, I don't know. Uh, but for now, it's a bonus just for because I couldn't fit it in the schedule. Uh, but it was a really fun adventure where um, <laughs> it wound up. It, well, I don't know. Do you want to explain the context? Okay, so. I won't explain the whole adventure because it's really good. Yeah, uh, and there's some good twists and turns. And Baz, Baz did, did a great job. job. Yeah, but for for reasons, we needed to go into this Louisiana nursing home and interrogate someone. And uh, and it wasn't like a swear to me interrogation, right? It was- She'd been there for years. Uh, we should just say we're here to visit her. She wasn't like under lockdown or anything. But Aaron got an Aaron. So he wanted to participate in some unnecessary hacking. So we literally went in. Ross and Holly right. went into the room pretty much instantly through the lobby. We were like, we need to talk to so-and-so. Okay, you go talk to her. And it's like, 
going to hack her records. So he's solid snakes around. Well, no, no, no. He, to be fair to Aaron, he, we wanted to find out if someone else was staying in the... Oh, you were right. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, oh, yeah. There, were, there was, He did have a valid reason for doing this. Okay. So. I, I was staring Don't at impugn him. I was staring. You're right. I would not impugn I, I apologize, Aaron. Uh, so... What rational thing did he do next? <laughs> well, he went in there to the records room to find out if this other person was in the nursing home. You know, so he's looking through the records. But then a ner- he failed a stealth check, and Baz didn't tell him he failed. He's like, he made his role for him and, like, wouldn't tell him what the result was. Baller move, Baz. <laughs> Good. Pro choice. Pro choice. Yeah, uh, pro tip. <laughs> um, and... So he went in and a nurse saw him. It's like, what are you doing? As here? he's like fiddling in a server. Yeah, yeah. And Aaron's lie was, can I use my computer skill to lie? Because I'm good at that. He's like, no. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm the IT guy. And, you know, he failed his default fast talk check or persuade check, whatever it was. And she's like, no, I know who the IT guy is. You're not the IT guy. <laughs> yeah, you're not Sean. Yeah, you're, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's his next move that really, uh, so I, and, unless you've heard it on the Patreon, yeah. I can't express to you the fucking comedic timing of this. <laughs> Cause it's like, I'm the IT guy. No, you're not. It's like beat, beat. I guess I'm going to choke her out then. <laughs> <laughs> now to be fair. To be fair, I suggested this. Oh, yeah, you were on the mic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't, oh, God, I wish it didn't record it because yeah. it would have been brilliant. Because it's just like, you could choke her. Yeah. And then it was like, <laughs> be Because I gave him the pregen with the unarmed skill. Like, he was a martial artist hacker. And so it really it was, was you leading a lamb to slaughter. <laughs> like, you should really be. <laughs> I am a little bit. I so, know. yeah, you could choke her as a joke. Everyone at the table laughs except me, knowing he will not take it as a joke at all. Beat, beat. I guess I'll choke her then. So, Baz, it's his first time. Yeah. He popped his air at Cherry. Yeah. And he's like, she's like a 50-year-old woman. He's like, I'm doing it. And Baz is just... and. Again, pro tip, baller move, like he's been doing it his whole life. He's like, yes, yes, you are, roll. (laughs) So he rolls to do it. He fails. Then I don't know if he fails a dodge or something else. But she like crit succeeds some sort of attack. She role. she she he put he puts in her chokehold, but before he can choke her out, she wins the uh, oppose unarmed. Choke. Oh yeah, it was opposed. And yeah. so like he she does damage to him and- uh, by taking her big pin and jabbing it into his neck. Yeah. So at this point, you know I'm in Aaron mode. Yeah. Just got to get as much out of it as we can. We just got we just got to finish the ride. So. <laughs> I describe as they're interrogating the lady, like through the waiting room wall. Yeah, just like this old woman running out and like you know hitting alarms and people freaking out and running everywhere. Followed by this like guy <laughs> with stumbling out with a pin shooting blood out of his neck. <laughs> so Aaron fails a sand check after this happens. So he goes into like catatonia or something, like his typical thing. And he goes wandering out into the nursing home yard. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> I think my character pulls out. And I find, like, hot, like your character, I think, just left. <laughs> like, you saw Aaron bleeding out of his neck and the fire alarm going off after you got done in character duty. You're just like, <laughs> yeah. put your hand by your face and just, like, kept walking. Whereas Holly's, like, trying to get Aaron, who's just, like, wandering around and bleeding on the front lawn of this nursing home, like, trying to get his ass into a car. And then my character pulls up. was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it was it a good was time. Classic Aaron. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, I I did like. Yes, I'm gonna choke. I, I, I yeah, I goaded him into it by yeah, you, you're presenting a, him. As you a, are the real monster. I am the monster, but it made for a good podcast. Uh, it did. So yeah, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, if you're five dollar level backer, yeah, please listen to it. Uh, I might. I have decided if I'll make that uh, open. To, I probably will make it open to the public because yeah. everyone needs to listen to it sooner or later. 
it was a good podcast before yeah. Aaron. Oh, no, it was Bans an excellent was... scenario, and he was a great GM. But like Aaron yeah. is the sriracha of game design. Oh like, yeah, it makes everything a little bit better, a little, a little spicy, a little dash Aaron. Yeah. It's gonna really perk it right up. <laughs> uh, you can't go wrong. Yeah. Right. Uh, and this is why you record podcasts, or why you record your games. <laughs> yeah. Because you never know when you're going to try and jump when, in. Uh, when a nursing home nurse is just going to shake a dude in the neck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, this is episode 136, Playing for an Audience. I'm Russ Fade. I'm Caleb. And we'll talk to you guys next time.